to get the speaker to work. Um, is there another? Are there more? Is there another? Yeah, yeah. You're in the ballroom. In the ballroom? Yeah. Even that glasses look different. Yeah. Never seen that glasses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Sorry. Uh, so, first of all, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Sepa Razavi. Uh, and uh, first of all, thank you all for coming in such great numbers here. Uh, first, in our um, as people organizing against Israeli settler colonialism, we wanted to acknowledge uh, our position currently uh, on the lands of the Ghanaian Gahaga. Uh, in English, they are referred to as the Mohawk people. Uh, and we are gathered on uh, the Teotihuaga, which uh, in English is uh, Montreal. Uh, and I think it's very important uh, to acknowledge this uh, be, uh, in any type of activism against settler colonialism, to uh, acknowledge the fact that our presence here and the reason why we have this panel tonight is that we are part of this process of ongoing colonialism. Uh, and the Canadian state, I wanted to say, was founded on the genocide of the ind indigenous people of these lands, and the present legislation keeps that uh, genocide ongoing, and um, I think that for us being settlers, immigrants, or um, <clears throat> descendants of those forcefully brought to this land, uh, it is very important in our collective duty to uh, educate ourselves and remind ourselves uh, and inform ourselves that uh, sorry about that uh, that uh, we are still part of this ongoing whitewashing of indigenous history. Uh, so. Lastly, right before starting the panel, I'd just like to remind everyone that on February 22nd, that, so this upcoming Monday, uh, McGill BDS Action Network is putting forward a motion to endorse BDS campaigns. Uh, so if any of you feel compelled by this panel tonight, please come see us uh, and inform yourself if you want to mobilize or just if you're undergraduates at McGill, uh, please come. Uh, November, uh, February 22nd at 3 p.m. at the Smooth General Assembly. Thank you. And uh, just to present uh, Stefan Christoph, sorry. Um, he's the <coughs> radio uh, CKUT host of the show um, Free City Radio. So, I, I think that the sound is working properly now, it seems. Can everybody in the back hear? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, uh, it's really good to be here tonight um, and to uh, just provide a short introduction to the importance of the discussion that's happening right now at McGill University around the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom and uh, liberation. Um, this movement uh, is now over 10 and a half years old, and it really has come from a grassroots effort, uh, not um, located in one place, but really all around the world. Um, and the panelists tonight, Zahia Al-Masri and Mustafa Hanawi, are two activists that have been holding it down on the grassroots level for a long time since the BDS movement was announced to the world in July 2005. Um, I would just note that um, the BDS movement uh, emerged on the one year anniversary of the decision of the International Court of Justice that condemned the Israeli apartheid wall as illegal vis-a-vis uh, -vis international law. So. The thing I would say briefly uh, in, in the form of introduction, uh, when I mentioned holding it down at the grassroots level, what I mean by that is that without this grassroots work that has been so important to pushing the BDS movement around the world, we would not be where we are now. And I think it's really important to validate and understand the power that, whether it's student groups or community groups hold in pushing forward um, difficult uh, issues vis-a-vis -vis the mainstream, but groups holding it down on a principled level and really responding to the voices of those who are oppressed in this equation, which are the Palestinians. Despite all the pressure, despite all the campaigning against BDS, 
Um, activists have been working tirelessly throughout the world now for over 10 and a half years. And of course, it's really essential to highlight that BDS was a call that was launched by over 170 Palestinian grassroots organizations on the ground in Gaza and in the occupied West Bank. So I believe you're, you're starting? Yeah. Okay. So I'll just I introduce briefly uh, Mustafa, um, who's a longtime uh, Palestine solidarity activist, uh, who is also an organizer at the Immigrant Workers Center in Cote d'Anege in Montreal, uh, is also a former member of the International Solidarity Movement, and was actually the coordinator of the International Solidarity Movement in Jenin, uh, West Bank, uh, for a period of time. Uh, Mustafa is also a founding member of Israeli Apartheid Week, uh, which actually started in Toronto, and um, is also a member of Tadamon uh, Collective. And uh, so I'll pass it over to Mustafa. And uh, again, you know, big props to BDS McGill uh, for pushing f forward this campaign. And uh, please give it up for, for Mustafa. Uh, thank you, Stefan, and, and thank you very much to McGill BDS Action Network for uh, inviting me. And also, uh, just to echo what Stefan said, uh, people should be really congratulated in terms of their their efforts to actually to make this uh, this motion on divestment and for BDS at McGill uh, concrete. And I think it's it's taken a long time, but. Uh, the fact that we're at this point at, at McGill University, I think, shows to the effectiveness of BDS as a tool uh, for solidarity with uh, the, the struggle for the liberation of Palestine. So I think McGill BDS should be uh, absolutely congratulated for their efforts. And so I'm going to talk uh, briefly, uh, not so much about uh, the issues or Israel as an apartheid state, but uh, BDS as a tool, why it, it is such a critical tool for us to use in, in, the, in our context being here in Montreal and also sort of even a more local context at McGill University and why uh, BDS is important, why students should be uh, supporting uh, the vote and the call for uh, BDS and, and sort of and, and why it's relevant to us here and, and not just sort of a, a distant act uh, or an empty measure of, of solidarity, but why it is it's truly important uh, in, the, in the global struggle. So BDS as a tool, as, as Stefan had mentioned, boycott, the campaign for boycott, divestment and sanctions uh, is now over 10 years old, but its beginnings uh, are actually much more uh, interesting in its, in its connections uh, to the South African struggle are very clear. So the call for BDS uh, that eventually came public by the 170 Palestinian organizations in 2005 uh, was initiated in 2001 uh, at a conference in Durban, South Africa uh, at an international conference against racism, xenophobia and discrimination. And it was there that it was the South African delegation that wanted to highlight uh, Zionism as a form of apartheid, as a form of discrimination and racial inequality that the international community has to uphold as a priority in terms of Israel's uh, acceptance of international law and international rule. Uh, and that caused a stir of controversy, backlash, uh, a boycott by Western governments in 2001 of the UNESCO conference uh, on racism, xenophobia, and, and discrimination. Uh, and it was from there that South Africans themselves, those who actually lived uh, the experience of apartheid, that began to lead the call uh, for boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, against Israel and uh, against Israeli apartheid. And why? And BDS was eventually, from there after the Second Intifada, when you had a popular uprising that was also had a massive solidarity movement uh, across the world, 
uh, demonstrations that took place. Uh, we had participated in forms of di direct uh, action and solidarity with Palestinian people uh, resisting the occupation uh, in the West Bank uh, in 2002 and in 2003 uh, because the international community was doing little, because governments like the Canadian government or the American government or the British government were doing very little uh, to defend the rights of an occupied people uh, and that Israel was able to act with a great sense of impunity. Uh, Operation Defensive Shield in 2002 was the largest mobilization, one of the largest mobilizations of Israeli troops uh, in the West Bank. Over 20,000 Israeli troops laid siege uh, for an entire year on the city of Nablus. Uh, they had laid siege and completely destroyed Janine refugee camp. Uh, hundreds uh, were killed in a very short period of time and the response from the international community was very little, it was almost non-existent. Uh, no resolution was passed at the UN Security Council and in fact what Israel had done uh, because they were able to do so with such great impunity was to actually res erect uh, an apartheid wall throughout the West Bank uh, starting in 2003, uh, quote unquote, defending itself from, from terror. Uh, this wall literally took apart the West Bank and took 40% of the West Bank, uh, which is illegal, again, under international law, but there were, again, there was complete impunity uh, for Israel to actually carry out uh, its crimes against the Palestinian people. Uh, and during this time, uh, in, during this time of the Second Intifada, there was continued calls for peace negotiations. There's no partner for peace. Uh, we don't have someone to sit with at the table. Uh, yet the obligation is not upon the, on the Palestinians. The obligation is upon Israel as an occupying state uh, to uphold international law. And that Palestinians are very much in their right to resist by any means that they do so uh, to defend themselves against the military occupation. Uh, and so it was clear that international law was not being applied uh, in terms of the Palestinians. So the call for international solidarity and what can be done concretely became much more urgent because what Israel was doing was not a simple act of responding uh, to what was taking place in the West Bank. What they were doing was carrying out a plan that was much developed much long ago because Israel has no interest in a two-state solution. And Netanyahu's made that clear. But Netanyahu's not the first person to make that clear that Israel's not interested in a two-state solution. If you actually look at the map of the apartheid wall, uh, mimics a plan called the Yalon Plan. Uh, and the Yalon Plan actually was the one that carved up the West Bank into three Bantistans, uh, completely separated from each other, that could not be a coherent uh, landmass in terms of, uh, that would be able to create a sort of a sustainable Palestinian state within the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Palestinians, and, and this is what's important about BDS, is that it doesn't treat what Israel is doing as simply a question of two equal peoples or two competing narratives, but the question of boycott, divestment, and sanctions being inspired by the narrative of South Africa is to highlight that Israel is an apartheid state and that Israel has always been an apartheid state, that there have been two laws for two sets of people and that the aim of the Israeli state is, has always been uh, that a minority of settlers will be, have the greatest control over land uh, of the indigenous Palestinian people. Uh, so, and I'm not gonna talk about uh, those issues so greatly, but if you look at the law of return and the right of return, Palestinians do not have that same right. If you look at, in terms of the occupation, Israeli citizens within the West Bank uh, have more access to water, uh, 
are prosecuted under Israeli civilian law while Palestinians are prosecuted under Israeli military law uh, and, and that Palestinians inside 48 face a great deal of discrimination. And this is what the call of BDS was founded on, that fundamental principles of universal justice, that Palestinians should have the same rights that Israeli citizens uh, are able to have, or not even just Israeli citizens, any Jew around the world that can claim uh, the law of return, Palestinians should be able to claim the same. Uh, and so it's not founded upon competing narratives, but an idea of universal justice. And I think that explosion, when that call was made uh, in 2005, was able to sort of, to, to begin to see the question of, of Palestine very differently. And the other important aspect of, of actually of the, of the BDS movement uh, is that it defied Israeli exceptionalism. And one of the things that we saw after the, the launching of the BDS movement in 2005 is that uh, why, why are people so focused on the question of, 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 of Israel? Why, why aren't they talking about uh, apartheid in Darfur? Why aren't they talking about uh, what takes place in Saudi Arabia? Why aren't they talking about uh, a, a number of countries around the world? But all of those countries aren't immune to international law. The, the, the Israel exceptionalizes itself because it doesn't want to adhere itself to international law. It itself doesn't want to adhere to Resolution 242 uh, to call for an end of the occupation. It itself doesn't want to adhere to Resolution 194. Uh, Israel has exceptionalized itself. Uh, and Israeli apartheid has exceptionalized itself. So the fact that uh, BDS has highlighted that exceptionalism that, and if international law won't be applied from states, then people in a grassroots movement around the world have a major role to play uh, in solidarity with Palestinian people to ensure that, th that their rights uh, are upheld. And I think the other critical aspect of that in terms of what we saw in the BDS movement is that uh, the Israeli state has continued to delegitimize itself. Uh, that what we have seen since 2005 is a countless massacre after countless massacre particularly in the Gaza Strip. Uh, we've seen nothing but a complete uh, continual siege, which is completely illegal, which has uh, forced 1.8 million Palestinians, in which 75% of them are refugees from only kilometers away uh, from their homeland, uh, from where they come from, have been forced to live a brutal siege uh, without access to medicine, without access to reconstruction materials, without access to the freedom of movement, uh, without access to their, to their, to their waters. Uh, and what we've seen is nothing but an escalation from Israel because the people of Gaza refuse an occupation, because they refuse to let, not let go of the right of return and what's just to them. Uh, and so Israel's response has only become more and more dramatic. Uh, and the call for BDS from people in the Gaza Strip, from the Islamic University of Gaza, from uh, the PGFTU, uh, pa the Palestinian General Federation of Trade Union, which saw its offices bombed, uh, it, from the university that was also bombed by the Israeli Air Forces. Uh, so the fact is, is that uh, this call is not just coming from the outside, it's not coming from activists, but it's coming from Palestinians themselves. Uh, and they're demanding our solidarity in this way. And that's what's also critical about BDS. Uh, and we saw that call again being increased uh, just recently with the beginnings of a new popular struggle uh, in the occupied territories where Palestinian youth uh, have taken to the streets uh, in an act of desperation where we're beginning to see uh, 
a very clear and calculated plan by the Israeli state to actually, for once and for all, annex completely the West Bank and truly show that there is no two states, that there is only one state, that all Palestinians are governed in some way by the Israeli state. Uh, we're seeing that in East Jerusalem. We're seeing that in Area C. So if people don't know, the West Bank is carved up into three areas. After the Oslo process uh, in 1993, uh, Area C, the West Bank has Area A, which is governed by uh, the Palestinian Authority, which is a very small part uh, of the West Bank. It only is actually uh, the three major cities uh, within the West Bank. Uh, area B, uh, which is under is Israeli security controlled, and then a Area C, which is supposed to be joint Palestinian-Israeli uh, controlled, and it's very clear that Israel is not annexing the majority of, of the territories under Area C. But regardless, and what we're seeing as a result of this po popular resistance has been taking place since this summer, uh, is a massive repressive uh, assault by the Israeli security forces against popular resistance, not against armed groups. Uh, in Berzeit University, in a building much like this, uh, actually in the student union offices, uh, the Israeli military raided and completely destroyed the offices of the student union, arresting student activists, detaining them without trial, uh, detaining them under, under military law uh, for arbitrary reason, because what they fear is another wave of popular resistance. What they fear is that people themselves are no longer going to cave into the leadership of the Palestinian Authority uh, and that they're going to resist the occupation. So does BDS work? Is BDS a meaningful tool? It's a meaningful tool not only because it highlights Israel as an apartheid state in the same way that the BDS movement did around South African apartheid, which was a clear act of solidarity and did help for the liberation of black South Africans against minority white rule, but BDS is working now. Uh, in the 10 years, uh, Palestinian activist uh, and, and one of the co-founders of the BDS movement, Omar Barghouti, it's called the This Is Finally Palestine South African Moment. Uh, that we've reached that watershed where BDS is beginning to have an impact. Uh, just recently, the American Anthropological Association, 88% in favor uh, of academic boycott. Uh, the Israeli media, uh, it's just highlighted that almost $30 million in agricultural sales have dropped because of BDS. Uh, foreign direct investment in Israel has dropped in 2014. Uh, we've seen countless uh, trade unions, uh, student unions here in Montreal, uh, the Concordia Student Union, the Graduate Student Union, uh, McMaster, uh, also the University of Toronto and New York University all adopt resolutions for divestment against those corporations that are complicit uh, in the violations of international law against the Palestinian people. And in the Canadian context, the movement for BDS is critical. Uh, many people say, well, this isn't the United States. We don't play the same role as the United States does in terms of the Israeli occupation. Quite on contrary, we play a crucial role we were the first government to actually to put a siege on Gaza. It wasn't the Americans, it wasn't the European Union, it was actually the Canadian government that defunded the Palestinian Authority uh, of its funds from the Canadian government in Gaza Strip because how dare they democratically elect their own government, even though that's what they called for, to get the funding initially. Uh, we have a Canadian-Israeli free trade agreement worth over $1.5 billion annually in trade. Uh, we have research, uh, the Canada-Israeli Research uh, uh, Fund, 
uh, which promotes normalization and, and bilateral research and development. Uh, we have direct support towards the Israeli military. Uh, if we look at corporations like CAE that uh, operate and fly uh, drones for the Israeli army, the same drones that are used uh, over Gaza. Uh, so it's clear that the Canadian context is really critical. Uh, and if Canada, quote unquote, is now trying to play again, being an honest broker in the Middle East, then that means standing in complete justice for the Palestinian people. And I just want to quickly end on McGill's context. Uh, the student movement has always been vital uh, to, to any solidarity movement around the world. Uh, and I think always there's going, to be, uh, there's going to be victories and there's going to be defeats. But if one looks back at McGill's own history during the struggle in solidarity with the South African apartheid movement, uh, there was complete resistance to divestment from South African apartheid. McGill only divested in 1985, uh, in April 1985. Uh, and you even have professors demanding in response investment in South African apartheid. Uh, and that's something that people have to remember, that, it, uh, that the support, we look now back on history and lots of people think, no, how could anybody support South African apartheid? One of the ugliest forms uh, of, of a racial colonial state. How could have anyone supported it? There was complete mainstream support for it. It was a, a liberal democracy in a sea of barbarism uh, in Africa. And it's the same logic that many people who support Israeli apartheid use today. Uh, and it was actually when students for five years launched a divestment campaign up until the point that McGill students actually swarmed the Board of Governors meeting at McGill University that they won uh, a divestment campaign at McGill and that they were able to expose those ties to South African apartheid. And it's those stories uh, that we should learn from uh, when we're thinking about BDS and how do we apply uh, the strategy of boycott, divestment and sanctions here uh, and how we can best expose those ties at McGill University, whether it be Technion, uh, whether it be uh, corporations that are complicit uh, in the occupation, uh, whether it be ending normalization with Israeli academic institutions, uh, and maybe we can discuss the academic boycott in, in the discussion period, but uh, McGill did create a successful divestment movement before, and it can create one again, uh, and its role even though it may be one institution out of hundreds or thousands of universities across the world, it is a voice that is desperately needed, especially when students in Berzeit are being crushed, when universities in Gaza are being bombed. Uh, it is a meaningful act of solidarity at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mustafa Hanawi. Um, we will... Um, now have a presentation from Zahya al Masri, uh, who's a Palestinian activist uh, here in Montreal, originally from Borj el Barajni refugee camp in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, and before that, originally from Palestine, of course. Um, right now, Zahya is working with Romel, which is the Regroupement des Organismes Montréal Ethnique pour les Logements, so the regroupment of Montreal organizations in support of housing. Um, and Zahia has for a long time really done a lot of work to try to link the uh, Palestinian struggle for justice with local struggles and seeing the direct connection between struggles in our own society for equality, for economic justice, uh, for justice uh, around workplace, uh, around housing rights with the Palestinian struggle. Um, so it's really great to, uh, to introduce Zahia, and please put your hands together.
Thank you, Stefan, and thank you very much for the invitation tonight. And honestly, chapeau and congratulations for taking this initiative. It's uh, actions like these that truly do count. Uh, as Stefan mentioned, I was born as a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon. And even though I was born in Lebanon, as some of you may know, uh, I still do get a card, uh, basically, and laissez passer from the United Nations uh, uh, refugee agency saying that I am, I was born as a refugee in Lebanon. Uh, to my parents' surprise, they were thinking that since we were born in Lebanon, we'd actually get a document that would state, would at least give us some rights, but that wasn't the case. And to have this form of document with you throughout your life leaves quite an impression. It goes beyond a symbolic impression. It's something that you carry with you every day. And this continued when we moved here to Canada, when we moved to Montreal, and everybody was questioning from Palestine, Palestine, where is that? Is that in Africa? Okay. And then on my dad's immigration documents, believe it or not, it was written that he was a pirate because my dad was born in Haifa and when Haifa was uh, still Palestine. And for them, they didn't recognize the state of Palestine, they didn't recognize Palestine, and therefore they didn't recognize Haifa. And when we insisted, we said, we even have his birth certificate. And on his birth certificate, it says Haifa, Palestine. Yet they insisted on in having the word pirate on his document. And until today, my dad is labeled as a pirate on his immigration document in Canada. So you can imagine as these things kind of follow you around. So uh, when I started going here, I went to Vanya as a CJAP. And when we started becoming more and more involved with the Palestinian Student Union, which was also HPHR at the time, um, the first reaction that we got whenever we had exhibitions or whenever we were talking about Palestine was members of Hillel coming across and wearing the Israeli flag and just telling us, you don't even exist. That was the initial encounter that we had. And this for me was quite a shock because having grown up in Lebanon and lived through the Israeli invasion in 1982 and the Sabra and Shatila massacre, to see this and see the same hatred being reenacted here was quite a shock. This was not something that I had expected to see here. And this carried out also throughout my years at Concordia, so on and so forth. And even McGill, in the same building, we held hunger strikes during, uh, during the time, I forgot the year, for the 400 deportees when Palestinian prisoners were sent to no man's land. So we held hunger strikes even here at McGill. This is all just to highlight the importance of actions like these and involvement of students, just in terms of raising awareness and what it means to be Palestinian. What it means to be Palestinian today is to be negated the right of your identity, is to be negated the right of return, is to be even negated the right to have the, the collective imaginary of a Palestinianhood that is even being put in question. Your entire identity is always being put in question. The first thing that is thrown at you is, well, you don't really even exist. Did Palestine really ever exist? This is the strength also of the BDS movement and what it did. Because it's a grassroots movement, it came and it gave a different framework for the Palestinian narrative. Now Palestinian students and Palestinian and those who support the Palestinian cause came with the BDS tool and said, you know what, this is what we claim. We are following the tradition of Mahatma Gandhi and following the tradition of Martin Luther King. And when Mustafa spoke about, about South Africa, this is the tradition that we are following with. Can you question these legitimate concerns? Can you question these? Are you gonna question the path that Martin Luther King led? Are you quest gonna question what Gandhi did? And this falls into the same category. The strength, again, of the BDS movement, and especially the right of return, is that it's a question that, that's at the heart of the Palestinian identity. And then when we speak of everything that Palestinians are going through, whether it's inside of Israel, whether it's inside the West Bank, whether it's in Gaza, they're living the same kind of settler colonialism, of oppression. You have the checkpoints that can be open and closed at any time. When I was in Palestine, I visited in 2004, and I saw the students at Birzeit University, I was impressed. I mean, here I remember going to class, and if the professor didn't show up, I don't know if you have the same policy at McGill, but after 15 minutes, if they don't show up, the class is canceled. And we'd be like, yeah, 
classes canceled, great, especially if you had an exam or something. Well, at Birzeit University, in spite of the checkpoints, in spite of the fact that there's a policy, even if there's closure, okay, and you have an exam, if you don't show up to the exam, that's your problem. The exam will still go through. And I saw students crossing roads that she would say, I mean, is it really worth it putting their lives in danger just so they can get to their university, just so they can have access to a decent education? This is knowing fully well that even after having access to, quote unquote, a decent education under the circumstances, their prospects of finding decent employment, of finding decent housing, of having a decent future are little to none. Yet they still pursue and they still persevere in order to have access to this education. And this is also what, what distinguishes the Palestinian cause is this perseverance. For decades now, what Palestinians have been going through, the injustice that is being basically lived on a daily basis by every Palestinian, whether in diaspora or on the inside. And when I speak of the inside, I also include Palestinians living under Israel because their plight is also being fought on a couple of fronts. They have their identity as Palestinians living under, direct, under the direct rule of their occupier, yet they have to, they've managed to thrive in some cases. They have managed to create IT companies which hire a majority of Palestinians still living under Israeli rule. And as you know, Palestinian citizens, as also actually Ethiopian Jews, are treated as second-class citizens within Israel, okay? And yet, in spite of all the pressures that they live under, they have managed to find ways to thrive. This applies in the same scenario as Palestinians living in the West Bank and even in Gaza. I have my cousin who's living in Gaza. His house has been destroyed. Actually, I lost count how many times the house has been destroyed. Yet still, when we speak with him, just a couple of months ago, his wife posted they went for the olive harvest. And she went and she took her mom for the olive harvest. In order to have, to be able to harvest the olives, it's a huge and very, very, very tiring process. And it takes hundreds of years to harvest, uh, to, well, a hundred, not hundreds, to harvest olives. Yet Palestinians, even in Gaza, they still go through with it and they still find the hope and the strength to go and to go through with it and then to talk about it and then to complain even about it because it was e either too hot or it was even not all family members showed up, show, show up. Yet still they go through with it. And that hope is at the heart of the strength of the Palestinian cause. Because after all, they have justice. We have justice on our side. When we speak about the right of return, the law of return now 194, it's decreed by the United Nations. Nobody can come and question that right. And everything that the Palestinians ask for is for the international law to be applied. Um, during my last visit there, uh, I went, and this is a story that I often tell because it's something that really speaks, with, speaks to me. I had my son with me and we were at a uh, demonstration for prisoners' rights. And I had my son, and there were moms, and they had posters, several posters of their sons being in, in prison. In Israel, you have administrative detention. When you go into administrative detention, you don't know what you're being detained for. You don't know when you're going to be released. Your family doesn't know either. And also in Israel, you could get a couple of sentences, lifetime sentences, all right? And in those lifetime sentences, it's really something that's up to Israel to let you visit your prisoners, know when they're going to be released, have access to them, and sometimes you have zero access to them. Um, so I saw these moms, and they had posters of their kids, and so on and so forth, and I, I, I couldn't help myself, and I had my son with me, and I just held him close to me, and I started crying, and this woman came up to me, she said, I thought she was going to comfort me, and she said, why are you crying? And I said, well, I can't help but seeing, I mean, especially since um, my aunt was kidnapped in 1982 in, in, uh, in Lebanon by the Israeli military, and until today, we don't know what happened to her. We have no news, okay? So I can, I can relate to what it feels like to not know, you know? If she's dead, at least we'd know that she's dead. We'd go and visit her and bury her and do what's proper, you know? But we just don't know. So that feeling of not knowing 
of not being able to commemorate those that were lost, you know, it takes away, it takes away from a person and it makes you feel like you don't have control. So she said, no, this is not a place to cry. What we're asked, what we are asking for is rightfully ours. The only thing we are asking, we're not asking right now for the release of our prisoners. We are asking to have access to them. We are asking what international rights give us, gives us as our right. This is what we are asking for. And this is what Palestinians have done for decades. And what the BDS movement came and strengthened even more is that we are asking what is rightfully ours. No more, no less. And until there's recognition, there's recognition of the Nakba of 1948, there's recognition of the Deir Yassin massacre, there's recognition of Kafir Qasim massacre, there's recognition of what's happening in Gaza, there's recognition of everything that's happening in the West Bank, there's recognition of the Palestinian diaspora, there's recognition of what Palestinian refugees are living in camps. You have camps in Syria, camps in Lebanon, and with the Syrian refugee crisis being brought into the media, just know that a lot of those refugees in Syria, they're not at their first refugee crisis. This is not the first time that they have been, uh, they have been basically relocated or their rights taken away or being taken to another yet refugee camp. This has all to be taken in consideration. And every action that is taken here, whether it's at McGill or at Concordia or any student body, is significant. Just the fact that you speak with another student and you raise awareness about, about what's happening, about the injustices that Palestinians live through on a daily basis, because sometimes these injustices are forgotten. And the media, unfortunately, doesn't speak out about them. Now we're talking about peace initiatives, peace initiatives. What peace initiative? The reality on the ground doesn't allow for true peace initiative or for true peace to be accomplished. Mustafa mentioned, there's no way that right now we can have a viable Palestinian state, especially with what's happening with the continuation of the, settler, of the settlements. This is still ongoing. We talk about peace, but the reality on the ground has nothing to do with peace. So just by raising awareness, by going, I believe it's next Monday that you have the General Assembly here where you're going to speak out. This is important. Every move that you make, every action, every time you spread the word about what's going on, don't underestimate it, it makes a huge difference. Um, I just want to close a bit by just mentioning the importance of the right of return that goes beyond the recognition, that goes beyond symbolism. I know that this is something that we live here. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to speak to a group of uh, Native Indians regarding their access to decent and so social housing. And this is um, something also that we don't hear about often. So that's why it's important, that the reason I mentioned natives is that it should go beyond symbolism. It should be concrete actions. This is the, also what BDS translates into, concrete actions. You support the Palestinian cause, you recognize the injustices committed, then automatically you support BDS. Thank you. Thank you to Zahia Masri. Um, and also to Mustafa Hanawi for um, their presentations. We'll have a brief um, opportunity to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, before that, I just want to highlight two points um, regarding CKUT Radio, which is the Campus Community Radio Association that is uh, connected with McGill University. CKUT has actually endorsed BDS, and CKUT Radio took a resolution to AMARC, which is the World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters, and brought it to the international meeting of AMARC uh, in Argentina. Um, and the BDS resolution was actually passed by the World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters, which was a really important gesture. And I think really uh, highlights a quick point that I wanted to link around objectivity, because I think within the academic context, a lot of people will sort of critique a movement like BDS um, as um, only listening to, say, the Palestinian perspective and try to present this notion of balance and objectivity, right? Um, within the context of a struggle for justice, 
you know, as student activists or as people involved in community radio, the idea that I wanted to, to put out there briefly is that we listen to the voices of the oppressed. Um, and that's really what BDS is about at its roots, is listening, as was mentioned by both Mustafa and Zahia, to Palestinian voices who are calling for justice and who are specifically calling for a global boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign. And I just want to underline that point, very, very um, important point, which I think is that as a solidarity movement, we are listening to what Palestinians on the ground are demanding, which is BDS. And we responded at CKUT Radio, which was not easy. It was quite a long debate, and it was also quite a long debate within the context of the World Association of community radio broadcasters, right? So I think that we really had a lot of discussions about that within the CKUT context because we are a community station that prioritizes voices of marginalized people. So for us, um, we really sort of have a critique towards this notion of objectivity in journalism. But I think within the academic context also, I think it's important to think critically about the ways that that argument of objectivity will try to silence the perspective and the voices of the oppressed. Um, so we have a bit of time for questions. Uh, so um, please, in your questions, um, uh, we have uh, probably, I think, about 20, 30 minutes or so. Yeah, so um, please keep them respectful. And um, I'll open the floor. I mean, the, uh, one simple answer is to look at uh, actually South Africa, right? And uh, one very simple answer was, I mean, again, this was the same argument then, is that uh, if we end apartheid, uh, black South Africans will, will drive us into the sea. Uh, we will no longer exist. Uh, if we have a one, one nation, one vote, one person, one vote, one state, the, the slogan was, right? And if we had that full equality, uh, South Africa would just uh, implode. Uh, and actually, South Africa didn't implode. Uh, so it's very clear by ending uh, apartheid, uh, Israeli apartheid, that, uh, it, that it, in terms of negatively affect uh, Israeli citizens uh, I think is wrong. I think what Palestinians are demanding is simple, simply justice. I think the status, and the other argument is that also it's the status quo that actually hurts uh, Israeli citizens at this moment. Uh, it's, it's the fact that they're seen as supporting an occupation. It's the fact that uh, they have to live under, uh, you know, the fact that they have to serve, you know, that it's mandatory for all Israelis to, to serve under the military, the fact that their state is imploding, the fact all of these things is a result of an ongoing uh, colonial project uh, impacts them uh, negatively, right? And I think, uh, so I think the, the argument that, you know, all of a sudden, uh, if there's justice that, you know, and, and that, uh, there was full equality and the right of return and the end of the occupation that uh, this would negatively impact uh, Israeli citizens, I think, as false. And also, uh, you know, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. It's also just seeing the other side also of the medallion. Is the status quo, like Mustafa mentioned, is the status quo better? The status quo is not better. Supporting institutionalized discrimination is not better. Uh, not supporting international law is not better. And you have to know also that not all Israelis, it's a very, uh, not all Israelis support what the Israeli government is doing right now. There's actually an increase of uh, like right Zionist 
soldiers who are being enrolled in the military army. There's an increase of quite a number, I forgot the number of percentage, but it's almost more than 10%. And this has increased over the years. So imagine if at the end, we have Netanyahu today, and with an increase of the even more ultra-right Zionism, what kind of an Israeli state do you have? And what kind of a system are you gonna have on the ground? So by supporting BDS, you're only basically supporting international law. Okay, we should just see one positive note that Israel has been the, the role of Israel. It went from Canada's best friend to a good ally. So that's good, at least. Defendion, you know, said it, so we have to recognize that. However, regarding BDS, I realize that the position of Justin Trudeau was uh, what you had just mentioned. And that's why it's important that in every institution, there is a push forward. It, the work is, happens within universities. This is work where the work happens. And uh, the importance is why this is a place for debate. This is a place where academics, where students have all the freedom they need to debate, to exchange ideas, and to vote on how, what kind of institution they want to be in and where they want to see their institutions going. So it is actually, and I, Mustafa, I'm sure you can add to this, it's very crucial that universities and all academic institutions continue and Mustafa mentioned, he highlighted a couple of the wins of the BDS campaign. This doesn't happen easily and it doesn't occur easily. And in spite of what he spoke, the importance of going to your elected officials and telling them, you know, this is what we would like, this is what we want you to hear. Don't underestimate your elected officials. If 10 of you go tomorrow, whichever writing that you live in, and you tell them this is what we want to talk about, they have to listen to 10 of you. If only one person goes and if they go, you know, every now and then, well, it won't be such strong, uh, such strong advocacy. But again, if 10 of you go, if 20 of you go, and they speak of the BDS movement, and they say that this is something that we think is legitimate, even if it's not something that they wanna, you know, advocate for, at least have a place to hear the BDS plan play out and to be able to vote and to be able to say why you support and why you don't support it. I mean, I think it's a good thing Justin Trudeau makes the, made those comments, right? Because it shows the, the impact. If he wants to give the BDS movement more media, uh, that's great because the unfortunate, the other side, which, uh, which you now, people go back and forth in terms of using to sort of discredit uh, the BDS movement and even the use on the international stage to actually discredit uh, the Palestinian cause is always dialogue. It's always the question of BDS is too much. How about we just have dialogue? And if people, you know, shake hands, salam, shalom, everything will be wonderful. Uh, but and that eradicates the entire problem that this is uh, a problem of uh, an oppressed people versus uh, an occupying state. It's not. Uh, it's not a dialogue of two equals. Uh, in the same, you know, and in in that translates to the way uh, those delegitim delegitimizing tactics are used sort of on campuses. Uh, Israeli academic, uh, Ilan Pape, I, I heard him say this once, that you're simply just a bad academic if you actually don't support uh, BDS and you're a bad social scientist uh, and have no understanding of, of history. Uh, so I think I mean, of course, BDS is going to be discredited uh, by Trudeau, by the government of the day, uh, until they see it uh, as being really popular, until they really see it as something that, uh, that would cost them votes. Uh, until that moment really comes, uh, I think that they're always going to end up supporting uh, Israeli apartheid for their own electoral reasons, but also in terms of 
uh, the role that Israel plays within the region uh, is also is also critical. So it, it makes our activism even more important. So we have time for a few more questions. Um, is there any others? Are you sure? This is your one opportunity for questioning uh, Mustafa and Zahia. Um, we try to have gender parity. So is there any? Uh, yeah, I. Okay. Um, go ahead. So I've been asked to repeat the questions briefly for the live streaming audience. Uh, basically, uh, if I can summarize, the question was um, uh, an, a request to respond to the critique that the BDS movement uh, is a blanket approach to dealing with uh, critiques towards Israel and um, that it could potentially delegitimize um, calls for justice, uh, human rights for the Palestinians and alienate some Israelis who uh, are sympathetic towards Palestinian human rights. Uh, are these questions important to consider? What do you think of these questions, if that's a summary? Even before the BDS movement, uh, Israel's practices, unjust practices, and non-respect of international law existed, and it hasn't ceased to exist. So the BDS in and of itself is not a reflection of, or a way of saying, uh, this is what's gonna stop Israelis, Israel's uh, unjust, basically, occupation, or settler colonialism, or uh, the illegal wall, or uh, any, any, any of uh, its unjust occupation or actions towards Palestinians. BDS, like Mustafa mentioned, is a tool. So if those Israelis if this has any reflection on, the, on those Israelis that you're saying, because a lot of them, they do sympathize with the Palestinian cause, then even more reason to join the BDS movement and say we are against these illegal action. Because it should never, you should never lose sight that this is in reaction to injustices being committed against the Palestinian people. The BDS movement didn't just appear in order to react to a non-existent threat. It appeared in order to address the issue which is the non-recognition of Israel of the right of return for Palestinians, which is the settler colonialism, which is the discriminating policies against Palestinians, which is the Israeli occupation. This is what the BDS movement is replying to. So those who do, again, those who do sympathize and ho those who do think it's gonna have a negative effect should just question Israel's actions instead of questioning the big victim's way of reacting and of defending themselves and for asking what is, it for what is, their, what is rightfully theirs. In, in terms of the, the critiques and, and uh, I mean, I don't have much to add to, to what Zahia uh, had said, but uh, I mean, I think that when, you, when one thinks about uh, that regardless of, of, I mean, you have people boycott from within, you have academics like Ilan Pape who says boycott me, 
uh, you should boycott me. Uh, you have that that voice, and also the fact that is is that uh, in I forget which Israeli operation in Gaza, uh, where there was almost not Operation Cast Lead, but the one after, where you actually had defense, where you had ninety percent support. Uh, of a of of a of a massacre on on, on the people of Gaza, ninety percent support. So in terms of uh, a, a negative effect, it, uh, uh, it's apartheid that's having a negative effect, uh, and that's isolating uh, is Israelis uh, in terms of within the international community. It's not it's not the calls for justice. It's it's actually it it is apartheid. That is creating that isolating effect. It's it's, uh, and I think that to me, uh, is the the biggest uh, response maybe to that, uh, to that criticism. So uh, we actually only have time for one more question. Um, maybe you can each ask your question uh, quickly. Yes. So I'll just repeat very briefly. The first question was about um, BDS being presented as a, a confrontation with the Israeli state and Israel um, as opposed to uh, another approach. I, I, I'm trying to summarize. Uh, I think I'll, I'll let the, the panelists Zahia and, and Mustafa respond. Um, and uh, I actually didn't really understand your question, but... Um, I, don't, I, I hope that you, you did. Um, I think it was about, is, does, as, is B, do you want to repeat? As, as in, as in, from your personal experience in Palestine, do you think it's very, is it very relevant to their, their daily expression? Okay. The, the way it's created? Okay, so is BDS relevant to people on the ground in occupied Palestine? So it's a question, pe fa people facing the daily repression. So this will be the last uh, round of questions. So um, if you could keep your responses. Uh, um, focus, that'd be really great. Thank you. Maybe I'll try to answer, I mean, the question of reaction or, or, or confrontation. Uh, I mean, BDS, I mean, a very long history of BDS and a very quickly, uh, the first call for BDS was in 1929 in, in Haifa, actually, uh, against uh, sort of the colonial project, the, the Zionist colonial project that actually had begun uh, in eighteen in in the late eighteen hundreds, right? Uh, so there was an attempt to try to uh, have a liberation movement well before, uh, and, and a nonviolent one actually. The longest general strike in 
modern history was of Palestinians in 1936 against British colonial rule and uh, again Zionist colonialism uh, and so and what we've seen is that from the history uh, from 1947 uh, up into this day uh, what is left of the land uh, and people's equal right and access to that land uh, is at a very is at its 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 last uh, stage. So is it a, a, a reaction? Yes, in a way it is to try to find uh, a new tool that people can use democratically, nonviolently, uh, in many different ways that they can uh, to sh express their solidarity in an effective tool. Uh, but it it is a way of being able to sort of. Uh, I mean, it is a it is a reaction, uh, but it's also one that is about uh, innate justice. So it's not a confrontation. You did this and I did that. It's about that there is no exceptionalism, and that we will all live in the same land with the same rights and the same obligations for all people. I'm going to try to bridge the the two questions because I think they're related in a way. Um, I'll start with this uh, with your question. Palestinians in the West Bank and in Jerusalem have been organizing in order to buy local, okay, for decades now. They actually have campaigns. And right now, there's a grassroots campaign that was started among Palestinian children from their uh, primaire and secondaire in order to talk to them about the pride of buying local, okay? Palestinian women have been organizing also from the outset in, pal in groups, in women's groups, also to produce local and to buy local because it inspires pride, okay? And it gives local Palestinians more work, more employment, and again, we go back to the issue of pride, and yes, it's a form of resistance. It's a form of saying, we are Palestinians, this is our identity, and we will buy local. So when BDS comes into play, like Mustafa mentioned, it's not, I mean, it is a reaction. It is a reaction to everything that's happening on the ground. It's a change of narrative for Palestinians because we're saying right now, uh, this is what has been going on. These are the injustices committed. And this is our answer. This is our nonviolent way of requesting that the international community acts towards Israel's position and the way that Israel considers itself impunitive and the way how international law doesn't apply to Israel. This is how BDS can be used as a tool. So in a way, it just brings all the legitimate concerns of the Palestinians uh, and pre presents them in a framework where it says, this is what we're requesting, and this is what we're going to give you to make these requests. It's time? Oh, OK. So, yeah. So we're running out of time, um, but um, wanna, yeah, we'll have a, one more announcement. And I'll just highlight two points briefly. I just want to acknowledge and thank again Zahi Al Masri, a longtime Palestinian community activist here in Montreal, and Mustafa Hanawi, a longtime uh, Egyptian Canadian activist between Toronto and Montreal. Um, and it's been really great to hear their perspectives. And also, um, big, big ups to uh, McGill BDS uh, for all your work. I just want to acknowledge uh, two quick points. Um, the first is that this notion and this push towards BDS in Montreal really takes place within a big context. And I just want to give one other Montreal specific example that's very, very inspiring and it's something a lot of us worked on for a long time. Uh, in Montreal um, in 2010, 500 artists only from this city signed an open letter in support of BDS. And so that was artists from you know, many celebrated groups, uh, hip hop artists, theater artists, members of Godspeed You Black Emperor, members of the Arcade Fire, uh, dancers with Mary Chouinard, like tons of artists signed this letter. And I just want to acknowledge this to say that this upcoming vote next week at McGill, and of course Mustafa mentioned the, the motions at Concordia with the Graduate Student Association, also with the Undergraduate Student Association, the CSU last year. Um, so your upcoming uh, vote at McGill takes place in a large context of a lot of big efforts that have been made 
uh, by grassroots activists, uh, student activists, community activists. Um, and so uh, when you're mobilizing and, and, and putting forward the energy for your vote, um, I just want to highlight the fact that there's a, a long continuum of work and, and your efforts are part of, obviously, uh, a big local effort. And, and uh, also just to highlight that, of course, it's resp in response to this last question, BDS was called for from occupied Palestine. So it was Palestinian activists who initiated it, and it's very much a response to that. So thanks again to Mustafa and Zahia, and to uh, SPHR McGill, and the BDS group. And uh, also we have these posters, uh, if you'd like any. They're called Imaging Apartheid. So. Thank you so much to the speakers. Honestly, give them a round of applause. They've been amazing. So again, a big part of why we're doing this event series is to raise awareness about BDS and also to have people come out to the GA on Monday. Um, it's very important that we get a big turnout because the opposition is mobilizing very strongly and the tactics they have using have been very lowbrow. So we'd like to counter that with very good competition and with bodies in the room basically. So please, if you forget, uh, the GA is Monday at 3 p.m. in SMU and the main room is going to be the ballroom, so behind you. Um, and if the ballroom gets a capacity, they might not be let people in. So it's very important people come around 2.30 or early enough so everyone can be let into the room so we can occupy as much space as possible. Um, also, if you want to learn more about BDS, we have a rabbi, Michael Davis, coming in tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. It's going to be in McConnell 204. He's going to make a moral case for BDS and he's going to talk about, about why BDS isn't anti-Semitic. Um, Thursday, we're having a Palestine a short film festival. We're screening three films uh, that were released last year. Um, two about Gaza and one about the West Bank. That's also at 6 p.m. in McConnell 204. And then Saturday we're having Concert for Justice or an open mic. So if you're a performer or if you know friends who are performers, come out to this event. It's going to be at Café L'Arter uh, Saturday at 8 p.m. if I'm not mistaken. Café L'Arter is on the corner of Jean Talon Park. Um, and yeah, don't forget about GA Monday and thank you for, so much for coming tonight.